Hello baseball fans and welcome to our first baseball oriented video as this week I've decided to cover the 1984 San Diego Padres. Before I get into that please like and subscribe as I will try to add more content weekly. It's been a little bit of a setback lately but here we go. I chose this team because one of my favorite players growing up was Tony Gwynn. His loyalty to this club is something that's hard to find in any sport these days. The Padres were established back in 1969 as part of a Major League Baseball expansion that included the Montreal Expos, the Kansas City Royals, and the Seattle Pilots, who a year later would be the Milwaukee Brewers. Much like any expansion team in any sport era, they struggled right out of the gate, and the city just didn't seem to care, as their attendance was one of the worst in the league. The city had the Chargers as well, who weren't much better at this time, mind you. However, in the 1973 season, a youngster by the name of Dave Winfield was starting to turn heads. By 1974, Winfield was starting to gain traction. Fans started coming out to the ballpark, as a matter of fact. Attendance increased significantly upon his breakout years. The Padres had their breakout year themselves in 1978, only to go back to a losing team, with their entire reputation being built on just how good Dave Winfield was. In 1979, they were back to being a losing team. Winfield, however, led the league in RBIs. On July 7, 1980, the Padres made a huge change. They hired a new general manager, Jack McKeon. But the team was still a laughingstock, and even Winfield couldn't keep people coming to the park at this point anymore. And other teams, they joined the league that same year in 1969, were having success at this point. The former Seattle Pilots, who are now the Brewers, had a winning season. The Montreal Expos finished second for the second straight year, barely missed the playoffs, finishing second in the NL East. And the Kansas City Royals won the American League pennant and made it to the World Series. Jack McKeon knew a winner was a long way away, but he didn't waste any time in trying to build a formidable club. As during the dreaded 1980 season, he traded Kurt Bavacqua and a player to be named later, which ended up being pitcher Mark Lee, in exchange for Rick Lancelotti and Louis Salazar. Salazar being the meat and potatoes of this deal. Salazar was a third baseman and prospect who had yet to play a pro game, being under contract, however, in the minor league systems of the Royals and the Pirates. But now he's getting a big break. He was a versatile defender who could play any position when needed. But the Padres were about to be dealt their biggest blow in the team's history. Dave Winfield, after eight seasons, four of which he was an all-star, was granted free agency. After so many years of being the big fish in a small pond, he was joining the rest of the Sharks in New York, becoming a member of the Yankees. Things would only get worse in 1981 for the Padres. The strike-shortened season saw them finish 41-69, and 69, and attendance decreased significantly without Winfield, who would play in his first World Series that year. Baseball America is what's quoted as saying the Padres have had the least amount of draft success in Major League Baseball history, but there were exceptions in this era. Even before McKeon came on board, as in 1978, future starting pitchers Eric Schoen and Andy Hawkins were picked up, as was reliever Floyd Chiffer and infielder Tim Flannery. Now you look at this bunch and you wouldn't really see a bunch of all-stars, but a team needs character players, and these guys would become cult heroes in San Diego. In 1979, they also drafted pitcher Mark Thurmond. 1980 was an overly strong year, but in 1981 they picked up outfielder Kevin McReynolds. And from San Diego State University, right fielder Tony Gwynn. But now we look at the two blockbuster trades during this time that McKeon made when he was dealing with the St. Louis Cardinals. He traded all-star reliever Raleigh Fingers, Bob Shirley, former all-star Gene Tennis, and a player to be named later in exchange for Steve Swisher, John Littlefield, Mike Phillips, John Araya, Kim Seaman, and Al Olmstead. None of those names would be by on the Padres team by 1984, but this man was, the meat and potatoes of that trade, Terry Kennedy, the catcher. The other blockbuster trade was to the Cardinals a year later, when they sent all-star shortstop Ozzie Smith to the Cardinals, along with Steve Murrah and a player to be named later, which was Al Olmstead. In exchange for the player to be named later as well, which was Louis de Leon, Steve Lexano, and all-star shortstop Gary Templeton. Templeton was seen as a huge piece of the puzzle. In his six seasons with the Cardinals, he had a batting average of 305, 911 hits, 281 RBIs, was a two-time all-star, a silver slugger recipient. He brings a lot to the Padres' table. But that wasn't all going into the 1982 season. McKeon hired a new bench boss, that being Dick Williams. Williams was a guiding force in the 1970s for the Oakland A's in two of their three World Series wins in a row. More recently, he had made the Montreal Expos into a division contender, but was fired as the team was in an NL East division race to end the season, which they would ultimately win. He takes on the task of managing the Padres in 1982. The Padres did see major improvement in 1982. 
They only finished 81 and 81, but it was only the second time in their history they had a 500 or above record. Terry Kennedy was second in the National League in doubles and tied for ninth in RBIs. Templeton was tied for fifth in triples. And rookie prospect Tony Gwynn played in 54 games, had a pretty good batting average of 289. As Ozzie Smith, however, would win the World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals as they'd beaten the Milwaukee Brewers, who now had former All-Star reliever Raleigh Fingers. However, their attendance increased dramatically, going back to numbers from the Winfield days. Everyone knew the years of damage to this team weren't going to be undone overnight. But they made another huge move in 1983, acquiring a man who was an icon just a near two-hour drive away, first baseman Steve Garvey. Garvey, for 13 full seasons, was the Dodgers warrior and leader. He made the All-Star Game eight years in a row. He was named National League MVP in 1974, World Series Champion in 1981, NLCS MVP in 1978, and he was a 300 hitter. He had a mass 1968 hits, 992 RBIs, and 211 homers, and led the National League in hits both in 1978 and 1980. A huge acquisition as Jack McKeon was changing this team. In 1983, they again finished 81 and 81, seemingly stunted in their growth, but Terry Kennedy did finish fifth in RBIs. Kennedy, along with pitcher Dave Dravecki, made the All Star game that year. There were still some missing pieces to the puzzle, despite the homegrown talent progressing on this team and acquiring such stars as Kennedy, Templeton, and Garvey, their pitching still needed a strong closer. After all, since Raleigh Fingers' departure, they have struggled in that department. So they went and got themselves Goose Gossage. Yes, an all-star relief pitcher who at that point was just coming off a highly successful six-season run with the New York Yankees, playing in two World Series and obtaining a ring in the process. He also won the AL Rolades Relief Man of the Year Award. Yes, they actually called it that. He was also a seven-time All-Star at this point. He was a three-time saves leader in the American League. He had 81 wins and 206 saves overall. A very huge 1.63 ERA and 1,076 strikeouts. He was coming off another good season in 1983. Well, as 1984 spring training began, nobody was really giving the Padres much of a chance. Even though they looked sharp, they had acquired many all-star free agents, had a star in the making in young Tony Gwynn, tons of homegrown talent and depth, this team was still simply a footnote in its short history. The odds makers didn't really believe in the club, and it was actually the Dodgers and Braves who were the top choices to take the National League West. However, the year began with tragedy as owner Ray Kroc, who had been a major factor in building the process of this club since 1974, died at the age of 81 on January 14, 1984, of heart failure and the team would wear his initials on their sleeves that year. Dick Williams had the Padres ready to be something they had never truly been. Winners. The batting lineup saw Templeton at first as the leadoff man. Wiggins, Alan Wiggins, as their speedy base runner. Yet Tony Gwynn finishing the top of the order. Garvey batting cleanup. McReynolds, Craig Nettles, and Carmelo Martinez and the given pitcher to round it all out. In pitching, you did have Dave Dravecki, Mark Thurman, Eric Show, and reliever Goose Gossage all being counted on to bring something to the mound. In the opening game of this season, on April 5, 1984, the Padres dominated the Pittsburgh Pirates 5-1, thanks to superb pitching from Eric Show and Goose Gossage. The defensive play from the Padres fielders as well were a key factor, and they only gave up three hits. Home runs from Kevin McReynolds and Carmelo Martinez got the team off to a great start. They started out 8-1, and, and in the final game of the month, they faced off in an important battle with their division rivals, the Los Angeles Dodgers, on April 29th, where first place in that game was on the line. Both teams only had five hits, but the Dodgers made the most of theirs, and the Padres left all their runners stranded in a 6-0 loss. Despite this, however, the Padres remain just half a game back of the Dodgers, and are significantly up on everyone else in the division, as the NL West was struggling a great deal in the early part of the season. On May 9th, the Padres faced off against the struggling St. Louis Cardinals, down 2-0 in the top of the sixth. An RBI triple from Steve Garvey drives in Gwynn while at the, the next bat, Terry Kennedy selects home a two-run homer in the Padres' lead and hang on to win 3-2, thanks to some good pitching as well from Thurman and Gossage. And to boot, the Padres found themselves in first place, tied with the Dodgers. The team was firing every which way. Their hitters with Gwynn just hitting everything in sight, McReynolds also delivering from the plate, Kennedy was also strong, as was veteran Steve Garvey doing his thing. 
Speedy Allen Wiggins was stealing bases and scoring runs. The Padres are becoming one of the most dangerous hitting teams in the league. Their pitching shocked many. Dave Dravecki was struggling somewhat, but Mark Thurman was really coming to his own, as was Eric Show. Ed Whitson was also playing pretty good to boot after a rough year in 1983. Also, Goose Gosses was still among the best relievers in the game. The Padres were on fire and shocking the baseball world. But then something happened. The team went into a tailspin and would lose seven in a row. They slipped all the way down the fourth place as teams were starting to show signs of improvement. But we're still only two games back of first, believe it or not. Be that as it may, the critics came out saying that Padres' team could be formidable enough to have a winning record, but nothing close to playoff success will come. Or that, quote, Trader Jack, referring to Jack McKeon and the moves he makes, was in over his head, making a lot of deals that just seemed like smoke and mirrors, short-term solutions or long-term problems, and that Dick Williams was hurting the Padres like he hurt the Expos. Yeah, right. The team was allowing an average of 5.7 runs a game, and while Gwynn was still playing very well, as Garvey and Wiggins also still looked good, Kennedy and McReynolds struggled, while Templeton's play at the play was abysmal. Things were once again looking like the status quo in San Diego. Williams, however, shook the batting order up a bit. He would do that a few times for the years. Wiggins, his strongest base runner, was rightfully switched to leadoff man. Gwynn was now second in the order, Nettles was now batting third, and Garvey stays a cleanup, of course. Kennedy was switched to 5th while McReynolds was moved to 6th, Martinez moved to 7th, and Templeton, who served the season as a leadoff man, was moved down to 8th in the order, last of course being the given pitcher. The move started to work, and the pitching staff was finding their groove again. The Padres started winning more games and finished the month of May strong, once again back in 1st place tied with the Dodgers. The Padres then went on a tear in June, winning 11 of 12 games, and that had a good 3-game lead on the Dodgers. As teams like the Reds started slipping down the standings, the team was coming together in all aspects. Compared to their June losing streak, the Padres were allowing two less runs a game, but the average is so high due to a bad 11-run loss to the Reds. Templeton improved. As Gwynn was switched back to third in the order, it would make him even better. He was a machine having a breakout year, hitting 404 at that point, it was making MVP caliber numbers. McReynolds' average went down, but he was still their best home run hitter. Wiggins struggled at bat, but was still big on their base running and stealing. Steve Garvey was on fire as well, batting 369 in this stretch, and Terry Kennedy had also upped his game in a major way. The Padres stayed strong, while other teams in the NL West began to, well, falter immensely. And going into the All-Star break, the Padres were in solid control of the division, a record of 49-34. and 34. Five games up on the Atlanta Braves. The naysayers were starting to become believers. As one former critic pointed out, their cohesiveness is astounding. They may not be the most stacked team in the league, but they are winning, and that's really all that matters. For the All-Star game, just seven hours north of San Diego, the Padres had three res representatives, including starters Steve Garvey and Tony Gwynn, while Goose Gossage was one of the reserve pitchers. Everything was coming up roses in San Diego as the NL All-Stars won the game 3-1. As play resumed, there was no stopping the Padres. Going back to Friday, June the 8th, the Braves were half a game up on them. However, that was the last time they trailed the division this entire season. So now we move forward to July. This team is beyond a force to be reckoned with. On July 30th, the Padres are facing the Dodgers again, and Dave Dravecki was pitching a beauty. He didn't allow a single hit, and fans were on their feet as a possible no-hitter. Every time he hit the mound, the fans would cheer. Unfortunately, it was broke up in the seventh inning, but McReynolds and Kennedy crushed a homer each. Gwynn and Wiggins were looking great, and they had a, each had a stolen base, as Wiggins was among the leaders in the league in that category. A 12-0 win, an emphatic statement. The Padres were shocking the baseball world. And on September 20th, 1984, the Padres were hosting the San Francisco Giants. On the mound for the Padres was Tim Luller, who had won o 10 games, but it also lost 12 on the other hand. The Giants were a lowly bunch, highlighted by the presence of Bob Brindley and Chili Davis to boot. In the bottom of the second, Templeton at bat, with the bases loaded, and just went out. He struck a huge RBI single to left, which drove in McReynolds and Nettles, and the Padres were up 2 to nothing. Then pitcher Lawler comes to bat, as Lawler was one of their best hitting pitchers. He had two home runs on the year to boot. We'll make that number three. A three-run shot, 5 nothing Padres. They were in cruise control. But the Giants got three runs back, and in the top of the ninth, Davis hit an RBI single. Oh boy, it was 5-4. However, the next batter grounded out, and the stadium erupted as the Padres rushed the field. They officially clinched the division title for the very first time. And we're about to compete for the National League pennant, their first playoff appearance. Yes, everything that McKeon had started building was coming to fruition. Williams was the best man to lead the team. 
a few all-star free agents, a big prospect, a homegrown talent made all this happen. The fans in San Diego have reason to believe was thought as impossible even just a year ago is now within striking distance and that's being a championship club the San Diego Padres long climb of prominence is paying off they would finish the year 92 and 70 their best year ever dominating the National League West in terms of pitching Eric shows 15 wins were tied for six in the National League while Mark Thurman and Ed Whitson were tied for ninth with 14 wins respectively Thurman finished ninth in the National League with an ERA of 2.97, showing he had a great year. It was one of only nine, as a matter of fact, to reach an ERA below three. Goose Gossage, more often than not, was among saves leaders, and this season was no different. He finished fifth in the National League with 25 saves. The Padres had improved significantly on the mound with reliable starters, one of the best relievers in the game, and a reliable relief and bullpen team. But now let's talk about at the plate. Kevin McReynolds finished ninth in the National League with an impressive slugging percentage of 465. Alan Wiggins had a breakout year, third in the National League with 70 stolen bases and tied for second with runs scored with 106, while Steve Garvey had 175 hits tied for seventh in the National League. But it was superstar Tony Gwynn who had the spotlight. He finished first in the National League in hits and batting average, tied for first in on-base percentage, first in singles, tied for eighth in triples, and eighth in total bases. They're just some of the major categories he excelled in. For MVP voting, Gwynn came in third behind Keith Hernandez of the Mets at second and the winner that was Ryan Sandberg of the Chicago Cubs. Many argue to this day it should have been Gwynn's award. However, Sandberg was on another level that year himself. Also, other Padres got some votes for that matter. Gossage, Wiggins, McReynolds, and Garvey. Oh, but we are not done with Tony Gwynn yet. Because while his stats were insane for the National League, the entire majors were significant for Gwynn this season. He was first in singles, much like he was in the National League, and continuing tied for the best on-base percentage of 410, tied with Gary Matthews of the Chicago Cubs, as well as Eddie Murray of the Baltimore Orioles. Among hits, best in the majors, Gwynn leads this list along with future six Hall of Famers. And even one or two you can make an argument for. Batting average, say it with me now. Best in the majors, Gwynn's 351, managing to hold off the Yankee powerhouse hitters of Mattingly and, oh yes, Dave Winfield. And, w wait, what, what am I saying? Yes, Gwynn should have been MVP, damn it. No, no disrespect to Ryan Sandberg. However, it is only fitting with that debate raging that awaiting the Padres in the National League pennant, the National League Eastern champions, the Chicago Cubs. The Cubs finished 96-65 and and won the division title for the first time since the divisional format League Championship Series began. And they haven't won a National League pennant since 1945 or a World Series since 1908. 76 years. In addition to league MVP Ryan Sandberg, they had a hitting crew of Steve Garvey's old teammate and former World Series MVP Ron C., former Phillies All-Star Larry Boa, slugger Leon Durham, Gary Matthews, and Gold Glove winner Bob Dernier, to name a few. On the mound, there was their ace, Rick Sutcliffe, joined by Steve Trout, Dennis Eckersley, who they acquired in a trade that season, and one of the best closers in the game, Lee Smith. Cub fever was running wild in Chicago, and indeed, they were the odds-on favorite to win the National League pennant with the feeling they're too much of a powerhouse for the Padres to handle. Game 1, the first playoff game in Padres history. The first playoff game for the Cubs since 1945 and at Wrigley Field to boot where a packed house was on hand. Show was on the mound for the Padres while Sutcliffe started for the Cubs. Oh, but the game was a disaster. Gwynn, Wiggins, and McReynolds all went hitless for the Cubs. Sutcliffe struck them out eight times. The Cubs smashed 16 hits in a 13-0 win. Gary Matthews hit two home runs and four RBIs. Also, homers by Say Dernier and even Sutcliffe did the Pirates in. Their pitching was a disaster, and the critics were quick to pretty much laugh at the boys in Brown. For Game 2, it was closer, but not the result they wanted. Mark Thurman was on the mound against Steve Trout. But now... Padres given up 24 hits in two games. The Cubs had a 3 0 lead after three innings, and the Padres are left playing catch up the rest of the way in a 4 2 loss and now trail the series 2 0. Oh boy, the Cubs were on the verge of a sweep in this best of five series, and the Padres' biggest critics came out to play yet again, where claims they were a team that benefited from a weak division. Not, not at all. 
giving credit to their hard work ethic, and the fact that Tony Gwynn was arguably the best in the game that year. But either way, it was off to San Diego for Game 3, a record crowd of nearly 60,000 fans at Jack Murphy Stadium. On the mound was Whitson for the Padres and Eckersley for the Cubs. The fans had faith, and the Padres responded. They lit Eckersley up. Gwynn came alive, going 3 for 4, leading 4 to 1 in the bottom of the 7th. McReynolds smacked a three-run homer to put them up 7-1, and that's how it would end. The Padres didn't talk back to their critics like so many on social media do today. They talked back by winning this important game. A huge game from Gwyn and McReynolds, and while Whitson and Gossage making their first appearance combined for eight strikeouts. However, you had to keep in mind that Padres are still on the verge of elimination going into game four. And what would take place was to this day one of the biggest moments in franchise history. Tim Lawler started the mound for the Padres and Scott Sanderson for the Cubs. In the bottom of the third, Gwyn at bat. Runners at the corners and 1 out. Gwyn hit a sack fly to drive in Templeton to give the Padres a 1 0 lead. Garvey then came to bat. With two outs, Wiggins on first. Garvey hit a ball to deep left, dropping long enough for him to score an RBI double as Speedy Wiggins made it home. It's 2 0 Padres after three innings. In the top of the fourth, Gary Matthews was walked, but Moreland and C flew out. So with two outs and a runner on first, Jody Davis came to bat. However, he shocked Tim Lawler with a two-run shot, and just like that, the game was tied. Nearly 60,000 fans at Jack Murphy Stadium were silenced. Next up was Leon Durham. Then he hit a home run. The Cubs lead 3-2, to two, and you could hit her pin drop. A shocking turn of events. It's 3-2 after the top of the fourth, and into the bottom of the fifth, they still carry that lead. The Padres were down to their final out of the inning. Garvey at bat. Tim Flannery on third, representing the tying run. Garvey hit the ball to center, and Flannery made it home. As the Padres faithful woke up at Jack Murphy Stadium, it would remain tied 3-3, as Garvey now had two RBIs on the day. Now at the bottom of the seventh, the game still tied at three. Padres down to their final out of the inning, and Gwynn gets walked. And Bobby Brown is at second. Garvey is at bat again. He singles to left. Brown races home, his third RBI of the game. The Padres had the lead back 4-3. After a costly error from the Cubbies, Gwynn made it home. It's 5-3 at their seven innings. However, in the top of the eight, Goose Gossage coming in to hopefully finish this thing. Struck out Gary Matthews, but Sandberg stole second. Keith Moreland came to bat. Single to left. Sandberg raced home to close the gap to a run. Jody Davis then scored an RBI, allowing Henry Cotto to score. The game was again tied, this time at 5. The stadium silenced once again. The Padres couldn't get anything going in the bottom of the frame, and the fans were on the edge of their seat in the ninth inning. Craig Lefferts relieved Gossage, and it was looking tense. After hitting Cotto with a pitch, he loaded the bases, and Ron C was at bat. It was looking bleak, but the Padres escaped unscathed, and now could win this huge game after C grounded out. The top of the order was coming up for the Padres, but Lee Smith was in relief doing his thing. And the fans were coming alive knowing it was the bottom of the ninth. One run can tie this series and force a fifth in deciding game. But Smith against Sans the crowd as Wiggins struck out. Gwynn came to bat and sacked a single to center, and the crowd was stirring now. now. Steve Garvey came to bat. With the game he'd been having, the fans believed he could be the hero. And lo and behold, he indeed was that. Two-run home run, Jack Murphy Stadium erupts and shakes to its very core. The Padres tie the series, still arguably the most celebrated moment in Padres history. Garvey has perhaps the biggest night of his career. Four for five, the game-winning walk-off, two-run homer, five count of five RBIs. The series was now tied, and Garvey was hailed as a hero in San Diego. However, on a sad note to end this game, they lost Kevin McReynolds on a double play attempt, and he would be out for this season. Again, nearly 60,000 turned out for the fifth in the signing game, and the Padres were on the verge of making history. It was back to the top of the pitching rotation with Sho and Sutcliffe both on the mound. But disaster struck early for the Padres. With two outs and a man on first, Leon Durham notched a two-run homer, giving the Cubs a 2-0 lead early on. It didn't get much better. In the top of the second, Jody Davis let off the inning. Home run. 3-0. Going into the bottom of the sixth, the Padres had only reached base three times. Just two hits. 
Sutcliffe and the Cubs defense had the Padres number, and Jack Murphy Stadium had been overtaken by the noise of crickets. It was the top of the order going into the sixth inning. Wiggins led off and reached first on a bunt that fooled the Cubs as he beat the throw with his speed. Gwynn then singled to left. For the first time in the game, the Padres had two men on, and no outs to boot. Then Steve Garvey came to bat, and you can feel the crowd stirring as his heroics in Game 4 were obviously still fresh on their minds. Would he be the hero again? Well, not in the way he was the prior game, but he did reach base on a walk. And the bases are loaded with no outs. Sutcliffe is feeling the heat. However, manager Dick Williams plays it smart. Craig Nettles is up next. Hits a sack fly. Wiggins scores. The Padres are on the board. The fans wake up a little more. Kennedy, sack fly. Gwynn scores. The stadium is shaking a bit. The lead is cut to 3-2. to two. But Bobby Brown grounds out. But either way, the Padres are right back in the hunt. The next three Cub batters are retired in short order. And it's off to the bottom of the seventh. After a walk, there's a sack bunt, and now we have a potential tying run at second. Tim Flannery is up, and a costly error allows Martinez to score, and the game is tied. Oh yes, the stadium is rocking to its score. We're all tied up at three. Back to the top of the order again. Wiggins singles to first. Now two men on base. Gwyn is up. The fans are eager. Double hit to center field. Two run score, and the Padres lead five to three. And oh yes, Steve Gurry, or as many fans have called him since game four, God, comes up to bat, singles to center, Gwynn scores, it's six three Padres. And now the Padres have to rely on a man who knows all about high pressure situations in the playoffs, Gus Gossage. As I'm sure Yankee fans who are still around at that point remember his ninth inning heroics in the 1978 American League Championship Series. So he struck out the first batter, but hit the next batter, putting a man on first. Dernier flew up, but Senberg hit a single, and then proceeded to steal second with Matthews at bat. But Gossage delivered his best, and struck him out as the stadium erupted with joy. But the Padres couldn't advance their lead, and they still had a 6-3 lead going into the top of the ninth. The city of San Diego was ready for a celebration. Gossage was here to close things out. Durham up, he flies out, one now, two to go. Moreland, however, singles to right. Say is up. He pops out the first. The pace is going crazy. Two down, one to go. A strike makes the fans go crazy, but a ball keeps them at bay for a split second. But they are still eager for the moment. The windup, the pitch. Grounder to third. First and a second of Padres for the first time ever win the National League pennant. Jack Murphy Stadium is a sight of a celebration to behold. The Padres are on to the World Series as their big guns come up in the clutch. History was made as the Padre Pandemonium hit the city of San Diego. And the National League Championship Series had no surprise. Steve Garvey, his playoff experience and coming off that epic Game 4 was the major turning point, showing his acquisition was indeed a huge difference maker. 400 batting average, 429 on base percentage, and 7 RBIs. So indeed, now it was off to the big dance, the World Series, for the first time in their history. Awaiting them, however, the best team in baseball that year, with 104 wins and his 58 losses, the Detroit Tigers. A lineup stacked at all ends of the diamond, led by shortstop Alan Trammell, second baseman Lou Whitaker, catcher Lance Parrish, all of whom were all-stars that year. You also had ALCS MVP Kirk Gibson, Daryl Evans, a veteran, and Rupert Jones, to name a few more. But the pitching staff was out of this world. Doug Bear, Juan Berenguer, Aurelio Lopez, Milt Wilcox, Dan Petrie, and Cy Young winner and MVP reliever Willie Hernandez, who had only given up six homers all year and had an ERA in or two. And leading the way was their ace, Jack Morris. He pitched a no-hitter earlier in the season and won 19 games, just one short of his career high. They were led by manager Sparky Anderson, the guiding force behind the big red machine, the Cincinnati Reds of 75 and 76, with two World Series wins. The Padres' main concern, however, was their pitching. They struggled in the National League Championship Series, but Thurman would be on the mound for the Padres and the big ace Jack Mora starting for the Tigers. Game 1 was in San Diego, and again a monster crowd of 60,000 in attendance for the first World Series game in Padres history were excited. The Tigers were playing in their first fall classic since 1968, which was the last time they had actually won it. 
Lou Whitaker let off the game with a double to center, and Trammell came up hit a line drive as a speedy Whitaker made his way home. The Tigers struck after just two batters. Down one nothing in the bottom of the second, Morris wasted no time striking out Wiggins. Then Gwynn proceeded to fly out. However, down to their last out, Garvey singled, and then so did Nettles. With two men on, Kennedy, Terry Kennedy, hits a two-run RBI double to right, and the Padres had a 2-1 lead as Morris and the Tigers were stunned, and Jack Murphy Stadium came unglued. Neither team was able to strike further until the top of the fifth inning, until Larry Herndon nailed a two-run homer, and the Tigers retook the lead. Then Morris took over, and the Padres had no response. In the bottom of the ninth, Brown, Martinez, and Templeton went down in successive order. The Tigers take game one, thanks to their ace pitching. A complete game win for Jack Morris, tossing nine strikeouts and clutch hitting from the Tigers. Despite the loss, the Padres looked determined in Game 2. The Tigers had 18-game winner Dan Petrie on the mound while Whitson starts for the Padres. It looked bad early on. Whitaker and Trammell single to begin the game. Gibson then single to center, driving in Whitaker. Gibson then stole second, Parrish hits a sack fly, driving in Trammell. Evans then single to left, driving in Gibson. Just like that, 3-0 Tigers. Whitson's night didn't even make it past the first inning. However, in the bottom of the first, Wiggins singled. Then Gwynn was walked to lead things off. Garvey's bunt advanced the runners, but he was called out. Nettles then hit a sack fly, putting the Padres on the board. It was 3-1 Tigers after the first inning. The next couple of innings, the Padres' defense and pitching were doing their thing, but they kept leaving runners stranded. But in the bottom of the fourth, Bobby Brown drove in Kurt Bavakwa, and the Padres now only trail by a run. Andy Hawkins was pitching well. The Tigers had no answer. And in the bottom of the fifth, with Nettles and Kennedy on base, Bavakwa comes to bat and nails a three-run shot, sending the hometown fans into a frenzy, and the Padres lead 5-3. to three. The Tigers had no answer. A huge double play ended their sixth inning. Three straight batters went down in the seventh. Only Trammell got a hit in the eighth, and in the top of the ninth, Craig Lefferts was in the game. He has been their best pitcher in the postseason so far, many believe. He struck out Harris and Evans, then Hernan hit a Powell pop fly. The Padres tie the series, and Kurt Bavacqua, the man they initially traded, was the big hero. And the pitcher comes through from Hawkins, who came up to relieve Whitson, and Lefferts was playing in the clutch again. The series now shifts to Detroit for the next three games. Tim Lawler started for the Padres, while Wilt Milcox starts for the Tigers. The Game 3 Tiger Stadium is ready to war and so are the Tigers themselves. It's already a disaster in the bottom of the second. Despite being one out away from retiring the side, Marty Castillo hit a two-run home run, and the Tigers now lead 2-0. Whitaker was walked, and then Trammell hit an RBI double, 3-0. Then Lawler loaded the bases for Herndon, and Lawler's night was done. But it didn't matter, as Booker walked him, and Trammell trotted home, 4-0 Tigers after the second inning, and they weren't going to look back. The Padres got one run back in the third, but in the bottom of the frame, Booker walked three batters, loading the bases yet again. They just say Booker's night was done. But again, Greg Harris didn't do much better. He came in a pitch, he hurt, he, he hit Kirk Gibson with a pitch, and now Evans trots home 5-1. to one. And the Padres are leaving runners stranded. And despite a sack fly RBI by Nettles, it was too little too late. The Tigers held on as star reliever Willie Hernandez just gave out one hit in the last two innings. And the Tigers take the series lead. The Padres couldn't play a more disastrous game if they tried. Bad pitching and leaving a total of seven runners stranded on base. And now found themselves trailing two games to one. With two games still play on the road. For game four, Eric Show was on the mound for the Padres, but Big Jack was back for the Tigers. It looked bad again. The top of the order went. Three up, three down. An error on the bottom of the frame allowed Whitaker to reach base to lead off the bottom of the first. Trammell then hit a two-run home run. It was 2 nothing Tigers at their one. However, in the top of the second, the Padres responded. A solo home run shot from Terry Kennedy. The gap is cut in half. Show then strikes out two batters in the bottom of the second. However, in the bottom of the third, Whitaker reached second and Trammell then hit his second homer of the game. Tiger Stadium went ballistic, a 4-1 lead. From the fourth to seventh innings, Morris and the Tigers didn't give up a single hit. The Padres had nothing. But even after breaking that in the eighth inning, they just had no drive, no determination. Morris and the fielders were killing them. A wild pitch in the ninth inning allowed Garvey to score. But Kennedy lined out a 4-2 win for the Tigers. They're just one win away from the World Series. The Padres have fallen apart these last two games. Morris scores another complete game win, and Trammell just destroyed them. The Padres' top guns at bat aren't delivering like they did in the NLCS. Their dream season may be about to end in a nightmare. 
Game 5 on the verge of elimination. The Padres need to bring it together, but again, nothing came in the first inning. Whitaker, yet again, let out the Tigers with a hit. Trammell got on base, but Whitaker was actually forced out. But then Kirk Gibson comes to bat, hits a two-run shot. The Tigers, again, took an early lead, 2-0. Chet Lemon hit an RBI. 3 0 Tigers. The Padres pitching staff is again taking the brunt. Thurman's night is over. By the top of the third, the Padres need to get back in this thing badly. And Garvey does just that by hitting an RBI single, driving in Brown. In the top of the fourth, the Padres show more life than they have, well, since game two. As with two men on base and just one out, Brown hits a sack fly to drive in Bavacqua. Then Wiggins singles to center. Templeton scores. The game is tied 3-3. A big comeback for the Padres. But in the bottom of the fifth, a Rusty Coon sack fly. RBI drove in Gibson. And then Harris hits a home run in the bottom of the seventh. 5-3 Tigers. Oh, boy. Bavacqua, however, kept the Padres season alive in the top of the eighth with a home run in the... And then in the bottom of the eighth with two men on and Gossage pitching, Kirk Gibson hits his second homer of the game. A three-run shot, 8-4 Tigers. The Padres are now down four runs with one last chance to stay in this game. Templeton grounded out. Bulky singled, but then Wiggins hit a pot foul. So now the season has to be kept alive by the man himself, Tony Gwynn. He truly changed the fortunes of this team. The first pitch was a ball. The second pitch, Tony hits it. It's caught. The Tigers win the World Series. The Padres did play two very disastrous games, but in the end, it was more about the Tigers just being so damn good. The Padres' Cinderella story indeed turned into a proverbial pumpkin on this night, as the Tigers won their fourth World Series in team history, and Alan Trammell was named Series MVP. Kurt Bavacqua came up huge for the Padres at the plate in the absence of McReynolds, as Templeton and Wiggins also played quite well. But Gwynn was somewhat of a letdown, while Kennedy played badly, and NLCS hero Steve Garvey was a complete disaster, batting just 200 at the plate. But we can't even put that all on them, as pitching was the big issue yet again, as it was a problem in the NLCS to boot. In the World Series, it was even worse. As starters Thurman, Show, Whitson, and Lawler were all very disastrous in their outings. Gossage was not effective in relief, while Lefferts did continue to be their best reliever. But the Padres had accomplished what very little thought they would at this point. In the vision of Jack McKeon, who made some hidden gem draft picks, blockbuster trades that were somewhat questionable, and signed great young talent, and built a seemingly improbable contender. In 1985, the Padres finished 83-79, and that's fourth in the NL West. Alan Wiggins was traded to the Orioles, and his baseball career was finished in the next couple years, suspended indefinitely due to reasons disputed to this very day. However, he would contract the AIDS virus and suffer numerous health problems. He passed away on January 6, 1991. He was only 32 years old. This is the first known baseball death due to AIDS. The team, however, got worse as well, as it seems McKeon's plan was flawed. Some derided it as a short-term plan with no long-term potential, as I alluded to earlier. By 1986, Dick Williams was out of the picture. He had gone on to manage the Mariners before retiring from managing in 1988. The team suffered two terrible seasons in 86-87, both with losing records. The latter, they finished dead last in the NL West. In 1988, the team did improve to 83-70, and but only good enough for third in the NL West as well. And they were nearly unrecognizable at this point. The only remnants of that team were Templeton, Flannery, and Tony Gwynn among the batters. However, Show was still their ace pitcher, while Hawkins and Whitson were also still pretty productive at this point. They finished the, ninth, they finished the, the same record in 1989, but this time actually finished second in the West. But by the end of 1990, it was a disastrous season, and Jack McKeon's days as a GM were gone. He would move on to have managerial success and still have executive success in the office as time went on. He would go on to win the NL Manager of the Year with the Cincinnati Reds in 1999, and then with the Florida Marlins in 2003, the year he won his first and only World Series. Tragedy again struck the 1984 team as Eric Show, who retired in 1981 after one year with the A's, was battling an ongoing obstacle of cocaine, heroin, and alcohol, and sadly he would lose his battle with his addiction when he left the rehab center in March of 1994. He went on a binge, but then checked back in, but would die in the treatment center the day after on March 16, 1994, at just the age of 37. Tony Gwynn, however, became an icon in San Diego, being one of the best all-around players in baseball this era. Some even called him the best hitter since Ted Williams. 
the Padres returned to the playoffs in 1996, winning the National League West. The playoff format was now different. They were swept out in the first round of the National League Division Series by the St. Louis Cardinals. In 1998, they won the West again, but this time they beat the Astros in the Division Series and then returned to the World Series for the first time since 1984 with Gwynn still leading this team after a grueling six games with the Braves. However, the New York Yankees were just too damn good at this point and swept the Padres out of the series. Gwynn retired in 2001 after 20 seasons, all of which spent with the Padres. He only got to the big dance twice, but he was revered as a true icon in Padres history and in the city of San Diego. His number 19 was retired by the team. He retired with eight National League batting titles, 15 All-Star selections, five Gold Glove honors, seven Silver Slugger awards, had a lifetime batting average of 338, as one of only 33 players in Major League Baseball history to reach 3,000 hits. He was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2007 in his first year of eligibility with a 97.6% vote. Tony Gwynn, however, was diagnosed with cancer of the salivary gland in 2010. Lymph nodes and tumors of the gland were removed. He underwent chemo treatments and was declared cancer-free not long after. He ever continued to undergo operations and encounter numerous other health problems, cancer and otherwise, as they indeed had to continue to remove cancer with growths to be found over the years. During a round of treatments in April 2014, a mishap led to Gwyn losing oxygen, and he had to try to learn how to walk all over again. Tony Gwynn lost his battle with cancer on June 16, 2014, at the age of 54. He is still idolized by the very city he spent his entire 20-year career with, and is known simply as Mr. Padre. Despite the short-term success and tragedies that occurred after, Gwynn and the 1984 Padres live on in the hearts of the fans who were there at the time to experience it, and their legacy lives on. Say what you want about McKeon's way of planning, but his vision allowed baseball to become something more than it had ever been in San Diego up to that point, and allowed Tony Gwynn to become a legend. Thank you all for tuning in. What did you think of the video? What other baseball teams would you like to see me cover? Leave a comment below to make a suggestion. Hit like and please share and subscribe. Until next time, I'll see ya.